This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Let's move on to this week's post-game chart deck, which is titled Snapshot of the Intermarkets. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says Looking for the Downloads. Patrick, page two is the S&P 500 Continuous Futures Chart. What are we looking at here? Well, listen, uh, I wanted to throw that, uh, use the 50 day moving average this week. Uh, it, you know, I don't like to market time necessarily off the 50 day, but I like to use it as a, a gauge for the primary trend to sort of see what what's going on and which way the markets are moving. And we can clearly see the S&P 500 obviously was oversold. It bounced toward that 50 day moving average. And in, in arguably, there could still be one more short term rally that even uh, approaches it one more time as it's co- it's common to see like a zigzagging style uh, price action going toward it. But in my mind, so long as this market stays in that downwards channel and continuously fails all of its rally attempts at these kind of basic moving averages, one must step back and, and accept that the primary downtrend is the dominant trend. And, and while everyone would love to fish for a bottom, there just isn't enough evidence out there in the markets that uh, a market bottom has formed. And uh, so I think the takeaway here is just respect the primary trend. Well, Patrick, I couldn't agree more. It does look like maybe we've got room for one more push up before we hit that 50-day moving average again. But just look visually at this chart. You can draw that downsloping price channel with your mind's eye, and it's a nice clear cut you know, looks like a downsloping and steeply downsloping price channel. And uh, I suspect that we've got quite a ways left to go to the downside. Let's move on to the NASDAQ chart on page three. What are we looking at here? Well, it's just the same chart, but what's interesting is the NASDAQ continues to be the much weaker market. And uh, at this moment, uh, each breakdown sequence is uh, makes lower highs, lower lows, and the rallies in the NASDAQ have just been so much weaker. And, uh, I, and you know, the, while there's more uh, natural implied volatility in the NASDAQ, so on a percentage basis, day in, day out, it's uh, easy to compare that, oh, the NASDAQ's, let's say, up more or down uh, more than the S&P, but I don't like to weigh it that way. I look at it really as the significance of uh, of how, uh, how big are the swings relative to where it's coming from. And the NASDAQ just continues to be an incredibly weak chart. And it, I find it very hard to imagine the S&P recovering uh, without there being some structurally uh, stronger basing developing in, in where almost all the selling originates from, which is in the, the unprofitable tech spaces and the fangs stocks due to these multiples. But and nonetheless, I just wanted to highlight that weakness. The, I want to move on, though, Eric, to page four, where I have that euro. And uh, you, know, you know that while we look at that Dixie at least um, always uh, in, in the market wrap, uh, the euro is the largest component. And we always are uh, just watching if there's any significant changes in this major currency pair. And uh, what we continue to see is an incredibly weak currency that continues to bounce a along the key support line. And what's amazing about that kind of 104 area, give or take 50 pips, is that um, that's the decade lows. And if we see uh, the euro give that zone out on the downside as each rally fails at, uh, below that 50-day moving average, uh, I don't see how parity wouldn't be in, a, uh, in a, the target of a next drop. And uh, so this is such an important support line. And just discovering whether the euro holds it has got to be like one of the top things for traders to watch. 
But moving on, Eric, I wanted to touch on crude oil. I want to first give you my little technical take on this, and then I'd love to hear what you're thinking as well, uh, just uh, you know, expanding on what you were talking about in the market wrap. But when I look at this chart, uh, we're pivoting off that 50-day moving average. Now, the pullback in crude oil that went down towards uh, 100 didn't get down there, but uh, that sell-off, while it broke the 50-day moving average, has more or less found support at what were its previous highs, and, and essentially, uh, has been just a, a basic Fibonacci retracement of its prior run from March up till June. And so to me, the technical damage isn't there yet on crude. Arguably, uh, if we see uh, any recovery of crude oil back uh, to 110 in the coming uh, uh, several trading sessions and things just keep uh, grinding higher a little bit, I actually would not take an upside move on crude oil off the table. But this is a, such a critical moment. Because if, if the selling ensues and we have 104, 103 failed rallies and everything starts getting very heavy, then those lower target zones that you just talked about in the market wrap become a reality and such an important moment in crude. What's your take? Well, I agree, Patrick. And, you know, it's funny. We just had that 110 test overnight last night, but it didn't last as we went into the OPEC Plus meeting this morning. We saw a big sell-off. And, you know, we still haven't priced in the reality of the recession that's coming. And I think it may be not just a U.S. recession, but a global uh, economic recession that we're headed towards. So I think it's, you know, another 10 bucks down from here wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. It would also not deter me in the slightest from my much longer term, very, very bullish view, because we're out of spare capacity and Oil fields inherently decline in production. They, they produce less and less over time. They have to be replaced by drilling new oil wells. And we're not making those investments to replace declining resources with new resources. So ultimately, without spare capacity, with uh, potentially even before you consider an escalation with Russia, uh, I think we're looking at higher prices still to come. Uh, as we get into the Russia side of this, you know, everybody's talking about these Western sanctions as if they're the holy grail. In reality, Western sanctions aren't doing anything to take Russian oil off the market. Russia is still selling its oil. They have record high profits from their oil because Western sanctions have had the effect of pushing the price up based on speculation that that Russian oil was coming off the market. But the oil's not really off the market. They can sell it to China and India who will continue to buy it. And China and India will buy less oil from Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia will sell more oil to Europe. And it all balances out. It's a fungible commodity. And and therefore, because it's a fungible commodity, it's not possible to impose a price cap or to levy meaningful sanctions unless you're willing to go to the level of something like a military blockade to physically force Russia to be unable to export uh, its oil. And guess what? You're dealing with a nuclear superpower. That's a really good way to end humanity on the planet for everyone by getting into a nuclear escalation. So I really hope they don't don't go in that direction. But I want you to just imagine a thought experiment, Patrick. Suppose that Vladimir Putin was on the phone right now with Xi Jinping and saying, look, here's what's going on. The, the West are playing this political theater game with their sanctions that don't really mean anything. We need to make a plan, Xi. Here's what I want you to do. Buy Russian oil from us this summer so that we can kind of bankroll those profits. We're going to need them. Uh, you're going to need the oil. Trust me on that. And when we get to the situation come October or so when Europe really, really needs our gas, that's when we're going to play hardball. And maybe we'll turn off the gas and the oil and we'll say Russia is not willing to sell any of that gas or oil to the West at any price. Now, she, I'm going to need you to help me because we can't just shut in our oil wells. That's a very expensive process. We're going to have to keep producing through that period. So why don't you start right now just doing whatever you can to buy ships, to, to build tanks, do whatever you can to increase your own SPR capacity so that 
in that period when we stop selling to the West, you're still buying enough of our oil to keep that production online, but you're not going to be reducing your consumption elsewhere. You're going to continue to buy the oil that you are actually consuming from Saudi Arabia and other OPEC plus producers. And you're going to buy enough Russian oil in order to keep us going. That's going to allow us to put a major squeeze on to where we take oil prices to 250 bucks. You're going to be really happy that you bought all of that extra Russian crude over the summer and into the fall at discounted prices because we're going to really squeeze the West when we get to the the time when they can least tolerate it. And oh, by the way, that uh, European heating season just happens to set things up perfectly for a big squeeze higher in prices right around the time of U.S. midterm elections. Um, why wouldn't, if you were Putin, why wouldn't you be having that conversation with Xi Jinping right now? Now, I, I don't know if that's the way it's going to play out. There's probably a thousand variations of that story you could make up in your head. My point is, Russia is not even playing hardball with the West yet, and I predict that that is still to come. So I think that we have a setup for massively, massively higher prices uh, in months and years ahead. But in the meantime, we still haven't priced in a U.S. recession, and I don't think most of the market has come to terms with the true significance of OPEC Plus being out of spare capacity. One of the reasons for that is OPEC Plus is not really in a position to explain the significance of being out of spare capacity, because to explain that would kind of, uh, you know, defeat the purpose of OPEC plus existing. If there's no more pricing power by managing uh, production, then there's really no reason for a cartel to exist. OPEC plus doesn't have any power. So they can't admit to that publicly. And I don't think the market has really figured out how dire the uh, spare capacity situation truly is. Eric, though, take a look at this Nat Gas chart on page six, and just a, a substantial material breakdown in, in energy prices when looking at it from that Gas perspective. Not only did it fail over the last two weeks to recover that big breakdown, but it just seems now the selling is just uh, feeding on itself. And I viewed it, the, that six to six and a half dollar area to being a, a kind of key level where if it was just a a pullback, some sort of a retracement and a resumption of trend that we should have seen some sort of buying come from that level. And instead, the selling is relentless. And uh, this really puts to question as to whether or not we're heading right back down to the bottom end of nat gas trading ranges uh, over the summer. Uh, any thoughts on this? Well, I think that what drove that first break was the explosion in Texas, where we basically lost a nat gas export facility. That means less gas is going to be exported to Europe. And I think in the fallout, in the wake of that event, I think the market has kind of figured out that that was an unrealistic plan that was really more political rhetoric than reality to start with. Um, as far as where it goes down from here, I, I still have to admit this much weakness in nat gas and this much much weakness in oil that we're already seeing even before the stock market begins to truly price in a recession really is a big question mark. I feel like there's something that I don't understand yet. There's something I'm not seeing in the market. Maybe there are actors in the market who are operating on uh, inside information that we don't have yet, but it does feel like something has changed. The whole $22 sell-off in crude oil doesn't really make sense to me, and I don't think anybody has really articulated a good explanation of why that happened or why the net gas chart is suddenly looking so weak when a lot of very, very smart analysts were expecting that net gas prices in the U.S. would eventually converge with European net gas prices. All right, Eric, let's move on to the silver chart. What I wanted to just simply highlight, like gold is just approaching key support lines. And, you know, you could argue that it's going to come and retest key supports and hold. But silver, which is considered, a, you know, the trading cousin of, of gold, tends to have strong correlation. But what's uh, surprising about silver is how it gave out all of the 2021 support lows 
and the rally that it had here uh, going into June failed to to uh, actually get back into the trade range. What was previous uh, lows acting as overhead resistance, failing at that 50-day moving average, rolling over. It just uh, it's so weak and vulnerable. Like uh, the question I'm uh, you know in the back of my mind thinking is is there a journey for uh, silver to head down into the mid teens during um, a, a deeper pullback, especially if the whole stock market has uh, a liquidity event, silver tends to fall into that basket, like you were saying with gold, as uh, all correlation of these assets goes to one and uh, these things start to all drop. Uh, definitely, this chart just lo- looks so weak here. Well, silver has much more sp- speculative interest in it. And with the whole Wall Street silver trend, I think it has a lot of less experienced investors in that long speculative trade. I'd actually say, Patrick, that the biggest surprise in this week's feature interview with Julian Brigden was when he said he he hoped to be a buyer of silver at a low 19 handle. Uh, I was thinking low teens, not not low 19. Um, And the reason I say that is, as you just said, if we see a stock market which is already selling off but selling off in a very orderly fashion if that becomes disorderly and we get an outright crash in the stock market it's going to cause retail investors particularly to panic there's more of them in silver than in gold and i could see a washout in silver it would be a terrific buying opportunity for sure but i could see the numbers going a heck of a lot lower than julian's number of 19. Yeah, well, just to put some reference that's not showing on the chart, the 2016 through to 2019 lows were all in that kind of 14 to $17, at least the major trade ranges were in that kind of 14 to $17 range. Obviously, we had a $12 silver during the COVID crash, but that was an incredibly temporary small dip down there that lasted just a few days. So, you know, to me, while you're, I think you're right, it's somewhere in, I'm in between you and, and and Julian, like I think the risk here below 19 is is very real, but I don't know whether low low teens is going to be the target. I I think that kind of 14 to 16 dollar pocket would be the kind of moment where I would feel a much higher conviction to put some risk on in, in silver if we got down there. Uh, I've I've been long in hedging silver and my hedges are working, but uh, right now this chart really does look weak and uh, down is the vulnerable. Uh, a path of least resistance for that. Uh, let's move on to copper. And here's another chart uh, that is just uh, so surprising to me. I mean, copper had that amazing run through 2020 going into 2021, where uh, the ESG movement had everyone certain that copper had a, a future and a big upside going to, you know, six, seven plus dollars on the upside. Yet uh, after a, a, almost a year, year and a half sideways trade range in copper with failed rally attempts, this breakdown is uh, now a legitimate new downtrend. And, uh, you know, I have to ask as to whether or not 350 or more is in the cards considering copper is so economically sensitive to recessions. They call it Dr. Copper for a reason. Uh, And uh, with this type of a downtrend and these kind of weak bounces, it just feels like there's more downside here. I think you're probably right that there's more downside. And the the problem with this chart, as you say, it's tempting to think, okay, Dr. Copper is usually the first chart to uh, predict when a U.S. recession is about to hit. Maybe what we're seeing in this big drop in the last several weeks is copper is starting to price in that recession that uh, I'm convinced is not too far off in in the future. The thing is that There's been so much upside in copper that was ESG speculation about, oh, we're going to go all to electric vehicles. It's going to change everything and so on and so forth. Um, I think that's actually good speculation. I think that that was a good argument because we do need to move off of fossil fuels. The mistakes that the Biden administration is making is that they're trying to phase out fossil fuels before their replacement has been phased in, which is incredibly reckless and stupid. But it doesn't mean that we don't still need to phase in the, re- the replacement. We just need to uh, be realistic about the time frame that's going to be required. So I 
think that as we do price a recession, there's probably more downside to copper. At some point, it's going to bottom, and I think it's going to be a heck of a buying opportunity. I hope I'm smart enough to buy a whole bunch of it pretty close to the bottom, because ultimately, we do need to electrify the economy. It's not going to happen as quickly as the greenies would like to pretend it's going to happen, but it needs to happen. It's going to require a lot of copper, and the ESG movement is going to eventually be rejuvenated and continue to punish extractive industries uh, like mining, and that's just going to put that much more pressure on supply. So I am very bullish copper prices in the long run, but there's plenty of room for this dip to dip much farther down. All right. Well, uh, in the final two charts I have here, I wanted to look at lumber and on uranium prices. But uh, lumber uh, really started to show the signs of a recession and the demand for housing and things like this with returning all the way back down to its August 2021 lows, more than a a 50% wipeout in lumber prices over the last three, four months. We're now coming to a pretty important support line and initially bouncing here. I'm very curious to see whether after like a short-term oversold bounce here, whether we're heading right back down to the lows later in the summer. I mean, this really just is such an awful chart, but it's just at a support. So it'll be interesting to see whether this level holds. With that said, Eric, I wanted to just touch on that uranium chart all these commodities, they're all doing the same thing. It's, it's amazing how the entire commodity complex in the last few months has, uh, has turned so decisively. Like it literally is just a few handful commodities in, with crude oil that uh, have been able to weather the storm on this turn. And uh, we have just seen such deep corrections and distributions really kick in in this entire space. We, now, the difference here, unlike copper, uranium is holding those 2021 support lows along this $13 level on the spot physical uranium. But this chart is so weak and the rallies are failing so much. It's going to be such an interesting tug of war as to whether uh, the support holds or whether the prevailing downtrend remains dominant. One of them is about to win next week. Uh, But right now with the way the whole market looks, it doesn't bode well. Like, I mean, we may see one quick break here that could see uranium head right back to those, uh, you know, uh, levels that it traded back through April through July. Uh, And so that's certainly something that uh, I'm going to be watching into next week. Well, Patrick, I think it just creates a buying opportunity. The question is whether the bottom is in yet. And uh, I don't know how to tell the answer to that on this particular chart. Uranium is uh, is such a volatile commodity. At some point, though, I think we go much higher as we realize that we need atomic energy. And it really is part of the ESG revolution. You know, the greenies love to talk about how important sustainable energy is. And they're right. We need to focus on renewable, sustainable energy sources. They've got that right. Now, why they can't get to the next step, which is the best renewable and most sustainable energy source is atomic energy. Um, who knows? It just seems to be outside the culture of, uh, of the green movement to recognize the obvious. Someday, reality is going to hit us in the face, and we're going to have to confront it, and we're going to realize that we need atomic power in order to uh, get off of fossil fuels and move forward with the economy. Listeners, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading, Patrick's trading service. Information's on page 12 of the chart deck, or you can find it at bigpicturetrading.com. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. 
You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.